Well, good afternoon. It is a real joy to be here with you and share with you from God's precious word during the course of this week. Uh, if you would open your Bibles with me, I'd like you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. And during the course of this week, our goal uh, is to uh, go through the book of Nehemiah as far as we can possibly get between now and Friday evening. My, my rough estimate would be we might get through chapter 8. Uh, that's a conservative estimate, but we'll see how we go. But let's begin by reading together Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and we'll read the entire chapter. It's just 11 verses, but packed full of fascinating truths. So it begins this way, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him, and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, in thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn to me, and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. And God indeed will bless that reading from his precious word to us uh, this afternoon. Now as we consider Nehemiah together, we want to kind of get the background. Why are we where we are when we come to the book of Nehemiah? What's the, what's the background to these, this particular book? Now I want to just kind of start by giving you some uh, some kind of information that's important. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, those three books are the last of what we call the Old Testament historical books. Books that kind of trace the history of Israel. These are the last of what we call the history books. And they are all connected with the group that either returned from uh, Babylon particular Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, after 70 years of captivity. And so what we call the return remnant. The book of Esther deals with those that didn't return, that stayed behind uh, in the land of their captivity. And so these books deal with this post-captivity period. And so uh, we, we want to see that it's under the time of the Gentiles, it's uh, under the time of uh, the Medo-Persian Empire. And so they, these books are very significant. They all go together. Now, as we think of them, I want to just mention that there are some, each historical book, uh, there, there are prophetic books that also go along with them. And so when we think of uh, the book of uh, Ezra, uh, for instance, 
we have Haggai and Zechariah go along with the book of Ezra. Okay? So they kind of fit in with that. Malachi comes a little bit after the book of Nehemiah. So it's just good to keep those things uh, in our minds as we study it. Now, let's think about a little bit of the chronology. This is all necessary background, and uh, it's important that we deal with this. But first of all, in terms of the chronology of events, so the Babylonian captivity was approximately 70 years. But in 538 BC, okay, 538 years before Christ, uh, the Jews who had been in captivity for 70 years were encouraged to return back to the land of Israel and to Jerusalem, and they were encouraged by the king, King Cyrus, to actually rebuild the temple. Uh, he felt that God had given him a mandate to, to encourage them to do this, and uh, most likely because he became acquainted with the words of the prophecy of Isaiah, and even before he was born, Isaiah had said in that book that there would be a man called Cyrus that God would raise up as a king to let his people go back. And so, uh, can you imagine him having the book of Isaiah read to him and, and realizing, hey, I'm the man. <laughs> I'm the man that God has called to do this. So he, so he does indeed allow them to go back and he gives them a, a, a freedom. Any, any Jew in captivity can, can go back. The tragedy is that perhaps there could have been up to two to three million Jews who went into captivity and only 50,000 went back. Now, you can understand for some reasons why you would not want to go back. For instance, they were going back to a land that had been devastated by war, as we're going to see in this book. The walls of Jerusalem were broken down, the gates were burned with fire, so it would be like saying, okay, would you, would you like to go back to, say, one of the cities in Ukraine, uh, you know, you've been a refugee, maybe in Canada, and, and now would you like to go back to Ukraine, you know, but you're going back to a place that's just bombed out. You know? So you can see why maybe some of them were feeling a bit more comfortable in the, in the, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, because hey, at least it's comfortable here. There's no evidence of war here. But to go back there, they're going back to this area that's been devastated by war. And so only 50,000 of them decide to return. And of course, they're, they're, they're people that they're zealous about their homeland. They want to rebuild the temple. And they begin to do it. They set, apart, uh, set about rebuilding the temple with a great zeal. They lay the foundation. There's great ceremony. There's just great excitement. The, the house of God is being rebuilt once again. But the tragedy is that immediately there was opposition. And it's true. We're going to see throughout this book. If we want to build for God... One thing we can expect is opposition. It's a guarantee that there's going to be opposition. So as they build, there's opposition. The opposition comes, you see, when uh, we've got to kind of look back and say, well, what, where, where's this opposition coming from? Well, basically what these conquering kings would do is they would take the people out of their natural homeland and then they would move other people into the land that they had conquered elsewhere. So they're kind of moving populations around on a massive scale. Can you imagine that? So people from other conquered nations had been moved into the land of Israel. And they had settled in that land. Now, when they first got moved into that land, there were a lot of difficulties. They were getting eaten by lions. And so that would kind of make you feel a bit uncomfortable. And so they, they sent and said, well, this is not working very well for us. Uh, we need help here. We need to learn about the ways of the God of the land, or the gods of the land. And so they sent priests back with them uh, who had been from Israel and, and basically tell them basically how to deal with the God of the land. And so what happened is these that came back, they intermarried, and they became what we know of today as the Samaritans, right? A mixture of the people originally from the land with Jews that had come back as well, and they intermarried, and the opposition comes primarily from the people that we would today call the Samaritans. They're the ones that are opposing in this work. And so the people became discouraged both by the immensity of the task of rebuilding the temple, by the opposition of these Samaritan people, 
and of course they wrote to the king and the king and told the king these Jews are a bunch of rebels and, and the king wrote a letter saying you, you better stop building until we do some inquiries here and so basically all that's left is a foundation laid but no walls that's where they're at so this is where we we pause uh, in the action so 16 years after this this laying the foundations Haggai and Zechariah begin to prophesy and stir up the people. And one of the messages that, that they give, particularly Haggai, he's, a, he's the older of the two prophets, Zechariah's the younger one. Haggai begins to say things like this, you're living in fancy houses and the house of God is in ruins. Consider your ways. This is not good. You're not in a good state here. Uh, your priorities are all wrong. You're building your own homes and God's house is in ruins. And so they listened to Haggai's message. Now Zechariah, uh, his was not quite as blunt, not quite as direct. Uh, his was a more encouraging message. He says, get back involved in building because great things are going to happen in this house. In fact, this house is going to see tremendous things. Of course, one of the tremendous things is the Messiah is actually going to come to this very temple. And so you're involved in something with tremendous significance. You get involved. And so between the two, the old and the younger prophet, the people are stirred to activity and they build the temple. Uh, they stop neglecting the things of God, give the priorities to rebuilding the house of God, and they build the temple. Of course, we might stop there and say this, that even though today... When we think of the house of God, we're not thinking so much of bricks and mortar, right? The house of God is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And it's made of living stones, right? But it's easy in our society to devote all our energies to building up our own houses and neglect working for the house of God, right? It's very easy to get caught up in the world and, you know, kind of uh, pursuing the Canadian dream, which is probably leaving Canada or going to Florida or somewhere where the weather's nice. I don't know what the Canadian dream is, but pursuing the Canadian dream, we could, we could be consumed with that, and the house of God can become neglected. And I want to suggest to you, perhaps the reason assembly testimony is how it is, is because we need our priorities adjusted. Because that's certainly what they needed in this day. House of God is in ruins. And they're busy building their own little empires. And so they responded. And so they took up the reconstruction of the temple again. And uh, uh, 20 years had passed since they returned from captivity. And it's all done. The temple is built. And then there's a, a, a long gap. And 60 years have passed by since the return from captivity. And a second group returned under the leadership of Ezra. And he set about the task of restoring the moral and spiritual life of the people. And he, uh, 458 BC is when his group come. Now I want to think about what's the significance of this. They've got the temple, bricks and mortar, it's all there, it's rebuilt. But now there's a, re a real need to restore the moral and spiritual condition of the people. And why is that so important? Well, why did the temple get knocked down in the first place? Because the people of God were far from Him, right? And so if their condition is no change than it was before, then they're going to be, the temple's going to be destroyed again. So we've got to get the people in a right spiritual condition. And so his job, as it were, is the restoration of the moral and spiritual life of the people. But still there's something else left to be done. Now we're 90 years after the captivity. And one of the tragedies is that the walls of Jerusalem are still in ruins. Got a temple built, but the city walls and the gates are all just like they were. And so this is where Nehemiah comes into the picture. His call from God is to rebuild the walls and rebuild the gates. And so we can say practically, like what's the point of us studying this book? Like, it, like here we are a long way down the pike since this. What's, what's our purpose in all of this? Well, what we could say is that if we're really honest, 
You see, this city, Jerusalem, was meant to be the place where God had chosen to place his name there. It was meant to be a very special place. And yet it was a, it was a poor testimony. Walls are still in ruins. There's rubble everywhere. Uh, the, the, the gates are still burned, charred, wood, everywhere. It doesn't look good on this city that's connected with the place where he's chosen to place his name. It's not looking good. And we might say, if we're really honest, that assembly testimony, which in our dispensation, place that he's chosen to place his name, is among his people. And many a testimony of assembly is in ruins. Many are weak and sickly. Some are asleep. I mean, generally speaking, conditions are not good. And so what are we going to do with that? We're just going to look at the ruins because people, remember, people had looked at those walls for years before Nehemiah came along. They pass them every single day. And they're not moved by it. They're not, they're not concerned about it. It's right there, right in front of their eyes, and they just don't seem to... And, and you, you, I travel a lot amongst a lot of people, and I can tell you that things are not healthy. A lot of assemblies are small and struggling, and humanly speaking, 10 to 15 years down the pike, there may not be an assembly there, as it looks right now. Uh, there's a lot of squabbling amongst God's people. We're not seeing much blessing in the salvation of souls. I mean, we can just go on and on. And let me say, things are not good. They're really not. And, and so we can look at that, or we can determine, well, we're not going to just allow that to continue. We're going to rise up and build. We're going to, we're going to work with God to put the testimony right. Right? That's the decision we can make. And this is what Nehemiah does. So that's really the book. Uh, it's all about this. If you want the cliff notes, that's it. Let's rise up and build, realizing it's a work that can be done. And so this is the background. Now, I'm going to give you a simple out outline of the book is how we're going to approach it. Chapters 1 through 6 is repairing the walls or reconstructing the walls. And it's all about the place, getting the place right. That's what they're doing first. In chapter 7 through 12, uh, to 13, the final uh, section of the book, it's reviving the people or the re-instructing of the people. And so we want to look at it from that perspective. And that's why I want to at least get to chapter 8, because in chapter 8, it's a genuine revival amongst the people of God. And so that's what we would like to see, right? Is a genuinely revived church. But there's a lot of lessons we can learn in repairing the walls first. So repairing the walls and then reviving the people, uh, that's kind of the theme of the book. Now as we go through, we want to look closely at the man Nehemiah. Because I want to suggest to you that as we look at Nehemiah, we're going to find this. That in a sense, um, all the material needed really to rebuild the walls was already there. Like everybody that works on the walls, they were already there. They've been staring at that rubble for a long time. But what was needed was what I call a spark plug to fire the engine so the whole thing could be done. Right? A spark plug was needed. Nehemiah was the spark plug. Right? He fired the engine into life and pretty soon the whole wall was done. 52 days, start to finish, the whole wall is completed. But it would have continued to stay there without a spark plug. And sometimes it seems like whenever there's a, a, a revival amongst God's people, God seems to take some individual somewhere and, and they come along and, and, and God uses them instrumentally to, as it were, stir God's people out of their lethargy to get back to work. And Nehemiah's the man. He's the spark plug. And we need to pray, Lord, we could do with a spark plug. Somebody who could get us moving again. Get us out of our lethargy. Get us building again. Someone who could inspire us to, to get to the work. And that's what Nehemiah does. Now, as we look at Nehemiah, and again, as we look at the book, we're going to see Nehemiah is a man who wears different hats at different times. 
First of all, we see in chapter 1, all the way through chapter 2, verse 10, we're going to see Nehemiah the cup-bearer. Okay? So he's the cup-bearer of the king. You might call him the, the chief butler of the king, right? That's his, that's his first job description. He's the chief butler or the cup-bearer. We'll think about what that job description was in a moment. That's what he was. And then, from chapter 2, verse 11, to chapter 6, to uh, six verse 19, he changes hats, and he becomes Nehemiah, the wall builder. Big difference in being a cupbearer in, in a palace to be a wall builder on a building site. But that's his next hat. Different responsibilities. And then, from chapter 7 through 13, he changes hats once again. And it's Nehemiah, the governor. And he becomes the governor of Jerusalem. And of course, we would say, for all of us, there's different seasons in life, isn't there? And there's different aspects of our service for God. There's sometimes we're doing one thing, and then maybe the Lord just moves into another area of ministry, and we're doing something else. And, and so we have different seasons of life as well in our service for God. And that's certainly the way it is for Nehemiah. Now, as we look at chapter 1, I want to give you a, a kind of a brief outline of chapter 1, and we're going to follow it as faithfully as we can. And so, we, we, we notice um, that uh, it, chapter 1 primarily deals with Nehemiah, his prayer for the work. And that's what we're going to be looking at, his prayer for the work. And I'm just going to kind of break it down. In verses 1 through 3, we're going to see his anxiety for God's people. And then in verse 4, the anguish, his anguish of soul. We're going to see him weeping, mourning, fasting for certain days, praying to the God of heaven, his anguish of soul. So his anxiety for God's people, his anguish of soul. We're going to see verses 5 through 7, his admission of sin, as he confesses not just his, the sins of his people, but his own sin. In verses 5 through 7, verse 8 through 11, his appeal to God. So it's all really about this man and his prayer. And of course, what we can say is this, that this massive turnaround in the life of the nation begins with a man in prayer. The whole first chapter, it's all about his prayer. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And so if we want to see change, where's the change going to come from? How does spark plugs really work? Well, how they really work, and I'm not talking about, I don't know anything about mechanics, okay? I'm just using that as an illustration. But, but how do they really, usually a man who God's going to use to impact God's people will himself be a man of prayer. That's what he's going to be. He's going to be a man who knows how to lay hold of God in prayer. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 1. This man is a man of prayer. In fact, we'll see it throughout the book. And so we want to think about uh, this man and his prayer for the work. And so it begins in verse 1, and we're going to see just the report that he hears and the anxiety that it results as a, as a, a direct response to what he hears. And so it begins this way, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. We'll just start with names first, because it, one thing about the Bible is every name has significance. They're not just there for a reason, they have a definite significance. And so the, the word Nehemiah means Jehovah consoles. Jehovah consoles. And then the name Hakaliah, so he's the son of Hakaliah. That's an interesting name. It means the darkness of Jehovah. Isn't that interesting? The dark, fancy calling your son the darkness of Jehovah. Why was it called that? Well, timing is everything, isn't it? What is the time? Well, no doubt he was one of the ones taken into captivity. He had seen the judgment of God on Israel, on Judah, taken into captivity, into Babylon, into Babylonian captivity. And so after this time of what we call the darkness of Jehovah, where he, he judges his people because of their sin and rebellion, we move out of that time of darkness 
And here comes Nehemiah. Jehovah is consoling now. He's bringing comfort after a time of judgment comes comfort. And so it's kind of an interesting thing to think of this. And so often, the key to a book is given right at the door. And I think that's kind of what's going on here. After, after a period of intense judgment, God is now moving to bring consolation to his people. And that's what we're going to see in this particular book. As a Jew, he certainly has reached a high position in the Gentile Persian kingdom. To be the king's cupbearer was a position of tremendous trust and tremendous influence. You see, these kings were always concerned about assassination attempts. And often how these assassination attempts could happen is if somebody could get to the king's supper and put some arsenic in it or something like that, we can soon get rid of the king, right? Poison the king. And so the king's cupbearer before the king got his dinner, the cupbearer got to taste it. And if he didn't drop bread, <laughs> you know, then it was good for the king. Right? So there's, you don't want anybody in that position who you cannot trust implicitly. In fact, he is the most trusted man in the entire Persian Empire because the king, his life is depending on this man. Right? If he is any way corruptible, <laughs> then uh, people are going to say, oh, you just slip this into his, into his water here, you know, or whatever. He would have water here, wine or something. Just drop a bit of that in. So, very trusted. But not only that, often these men were advisors to the king. And they had the ears of the king. Remember the story of Joseph and the cupbearer? Remember how... Uh, the, the man had a dream and, and so did the baker and, and Joseph interpreted the dreams and Joseph said, you know, when you go, remember me to Pharaoh, tell him about, and of course he went there, got his job back, forgot all about Joseph. And then the king has a bad dream. And so he, he's very distraught about this dream and the cupbearer says, I know just a man, just a man that can interpret your dreams. <laughs> and he tells him about Joseph. And so he's got the, not only access to the king, brings food to the king, brings wine to the king, he has the ear of the king. And so imagine this, this man, Nehemiah, has risen, a Jew, has risen to the top in a sense in the Babylonian Empire, Myrtle, Medo Persian Empire. And so he's got this fantastic position because he's got to have. You know, if the king wakes up in the middle of the night and he wants, uh, you know, a bowl of Cheerios or something or whatever he wants, Nehemiah's got to be on duty. So he probably slept and lived in the palace. So not only has he got a good job, he's got nice accommodation thrown in for free. No doubt the best clothing. You don't want to look scruffy in the presence of the king. So even his outfits were to be provided. I mean, this guy's got it. I mean, as far as success in the world is concerned, this guy's got a great number. He really has. And it is interesting, is that we, we tend to look down today on people who are in service-type positions. And I, I can remember years ago, I probably told you this before, but I, I, I was talking to a guy. He was an organist in a, a little kind of a, a Puritan chapel. It was actually built by the Puritans. Uh, in a place called Matlock Bath in England. And uh, anyway, we just happened to be visiting there. They had a visiting speaker. And, and anyway, this, um, the guy was playing the organ. I somehow got talking to him. And you know how you do? He asked, well, what do you do for a living? And he said, oh, I'm just a servant. And I was kind of taken aback because, you know, I know in, in England in the past, there would have been a lot of servants. But this, this, was, this was in the 1980s, you know. You don't have too many people who have servants anymore in the 1980s. So I said to him, I said, oh, uh, who do you work for? He said, Queen Elizabeth II. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. He actually worked at Buckingham Palace. Mm 
Suddenly, I'm not looking down on this guy thinking, poor old guy, he's just a servant. I'm thinking, wow, he's got a pretty dignified role here. And don't forget, every one of us in this room, we're also servants of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there's a great dignity connected with that, isn't there? And so certainly we find here <laughs> that he's got this position, and yet it tells us in verse 2 that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. So he heard that some brethren had made a trip back from Jerusalem, and he wanted to know the well-being of the Jews and of Jerusalem. So for all his success seemingly in the world, he hasn't forgotten where he's come from. He hasn't forgotten who his people are. And, and so he, he's got a concern. How are the people of God doing? How are they getting on? The welfare of God's people. Because in the Old Testament, the Jews were the people of God, weren't they? How are they doing? How are they getting on? And then secondly, what about Jerusalem? What about the place that God has chosen to place his name? How's that been? And so for all his success, he has not neglected the welfare of the people of God in the place where God has chosen to place his name. And that should be our concern too, isn't it? Are we concerned? How are God's people doing? I was telling some folks recently that I'm really enjoying, I always enjoy flying, which is good, but I've got a new dimension to my flying these days, and that is these maps that they have behind the sea. And I love looking at these maps, and, and why I'm enjoying it so much is, as, as you, you put that map on, I keep seeing the names of these places. And each place, many of them I've been to, and many of them I've been to the assemblies in those places. And so I use it as an opportunity to use my flight for praying for the different meetings that come up on the map. And it's wonderful. And so this little place comes up, oh yeah, I remember there, and I remember some of the people in that assembly, and I begin to pray, well, and then I get another place, and it just makes the flight go by so quickly. But what's behind it all? What's behind it all is you want God's people to do well. You have a heart for the people of God. You want them to prosper. You want them to grow. You want the assemblies of God's people to prosper. And so you begin to cry out to God for them. You pray for them. And we should never lose the heart for God's people. We want them to do well. You know, just as I get older, I keep having this, this thought, Lord, I want to cross the finish line well. Not just me. I want all my brethren to come with me. Every one of us to finish well. Not to fall in the final hurdle, but to win. To cross, to get the prize. And we should have that burden for God's people. It should be on our hearts. It should be a primary concern to us. How are the people of God doing in Moncton, New Brunswick? How, how are they doing in St. John? How, how are they doing in Truro and all these other places or whatever? How, how are they doing? How's the testimony there? Is the lampstand shining brightly for the Lord Jesus? That should be the object of our prayers. But what he hears is not good. It says, they said to me, the remnant that are left of the captivity, there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. The gates thereof are burned with fire. So, what a sad report. The city, which should be a city of glory and praise, is in great affliction and reproach. The walls are broken down, the gates are burned with fire. Now what's the significance of walls and gates? Why the big deal? Well, from a very practical standpoint, the defense of a city 
was dependent on its walls in those days. That was their protection from invasion enemy. In fact, if you just look at the book of Proverbs just for a minute, uh, you'll notice in Proverbs 25 and verse 28, you'll notice it says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. And the thought here is this, that a city that is broken down and without walls, the enemy can come in at will. Just whenever he wants. There's no defenses. And so, from a practical standpoint, beautiful temple, but there's no defense. There's no walls. The enemy can come in whenever he wants. And so we've got to have walls and gates. And of course the walls are to keep the enemies out, the gates are to let the friends in. <laughs> we need walls and we need gates, and we need good men on the gates to make sure his friends come in. We've been talking a lot about false teachers. Uh, they've got to be careful that they are on the gates and manning the gates well. We're not trying to keep God's people away, but we are trying to keep the enemies away. And so that idea of that being posted on the gates. But there's an even more beautiful picture concerning walls and gates. Look at Isaiah 60. The prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 60. And we will look together at verse 18. Isaiah 60, verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. Isn't that a beautiful description. Walls, salvation, gates, praise. And so as we think in terms of assembly testimony, we might put it this way, that we would love to be part of an assembly where salvation is happening constantly. And as a result of that, as a result of seeing people gloriously saved, great praise ascending to God. Because isn't that great praise when, well, there's praise in heaven, isn't there? Or for one more sinner that repents. Like, how much more would it be if this place was seeing people born again frequently in these very walls? Salvation. <laughs> and what would that result in? You think you say, oh, what a shame, another person just got saved. No, I think you'd be pretty excited. Wouldn't you? I hope you would be. You'd be thrilled. People are getting saved here. And so, the walls are down. Broken down. Gates burned with fire. The remnant of the captivity are in great affliction and reproach. And so, and again, 90 years have passed since the first captives had returned and the condition, both physically and spiritually, was still dire. It's not good, it's not healthy. What report could we give concerning assembly testimony in the Maritimes? I mean, it'd be interesting enough, how would you give your report? What would you say? Somebody asks you, well, how are things going there? Give an honest report. Is there any reproach? Has there been anything happened in our assemblies that would be a reproach to the name of Christ? Has anything been done that would reproach that ugly name of His? Anything that, that should give us cause for concern? So how does he respond? How do we respond when we see conditions like this? Notice what it says. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. What a, a very dramatic response from Nehemiah. Weeping, mourning, fasting. 
If we're ever going to see revival, it will always begin with people who are broken hearted over the conditions as they are now. They're not content with the status quo. They're not happy with the way it is. They're not willing to see the reproach and the affliction and be unmoved by it. It begins when people get broken hearted over the condition of things. That's how it begins. And so he, he wept. He wept over Jerusalem. Do you know anybody else that did that? I do. He's just like his master, isn't he? He wept over Jerusalem. And yet, I wonder sometimes, Lord, why are my eyes so dry? Why do I have so few tears? I have had tears before. I never forget one time I was at a, a camp and you know, people were telling me about the, the trials in the assembly, a lot of young couples, and they said, Mike, we love the assembly, we don't want to go anywhere else, but we don't know where we can stay. Our hearts are broken because of what was going on. And I remember going to my bed that night and just crying myself to sleep over the condition of things amongst the people of God. See, we've got to ask ourselves, oh, do we have any tears? He wept. He mourned. I mean, it's a biblical idea, isn't it? Uh, to, to mourn. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, right? That's what the Word of God says. Matthew 5 is in verse 4. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. Sorry, 1 Corinthians 5. I apologize. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's an immorality going on in the Corinthian assembly. And he says in verse 2, you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Paul says an appropriate response to sin in the assembly should be a time of mourning. Wow, isn't that something? Yeah, have you ever seen that done? Doesn't happen very often, does it? He wept, he mourned, he fasted. Now again, as believers, we know a lot more about feasting than we do about fasting. And sometimes people say, well, that's Old Testament. They're not reading their New Testament very carefully. Fasting is very clear. God says, when he was asked, how come your disciples don't fast? John's disciples fast, yours don't fast. He, he said, uh, when the bridegroom is with them, they're not going to fast. When he's gone, then they'll fast. Well, as far as I know, he's not with us right now, physically. And so it's a time to fast. Do assemblies fast? Is it, is it just an individual thing? Well, that's what you hear, but that's not what they understood in the New Testament. Look at Acts 13. Acts 13, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon. This is Acts 13, 1, with <coughs> Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now is Acts 13 New Testament? Last time I heard it was. Is it a church? Yeah, it is. And we can say, at the very least, these five men are fasting, but I suspect it was the whole assembly that was fasting. 
And they were seeking God together. And maybe they were seeking God for a purpose. I think they were seeking God, how do we fulfill the Great Commission? As they're doing that, and they're praying, and they're fasting, the Holy Ghost says, this is how you do it. Send Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called. Interesting, isn't it? And yet, it's such a foreign concept to us. I'm not asking for a raising of hands if anybody's fasted or not. I'm not going to do that. But it's worth asking yourself the question. Have you ever been so burdened about something that you've done without legitimate things so that you might use that time to seek God in prayer? See, eating is legitimate. legitimate it's a legitimate thing. Uh, and yet, we do without something legitimate so we can devote our time to prayer. Now let me just go a step further here because I think in our culture, uh, back in those days, food preparation was incredibly time consuming. No supermarkets, no loaves of bread you could just pull off the shelf. I mean, everything is from scratch. It's very time consuming. It takes up a lot of your day preparing the meals, right? And so, by the way, thank you, sisters, for the great food, and I'm sure you put a lot of time in, but, but you probably did. You may have used a microwave or some kind of quick things in the process, right? Back then, this is a long process. And so they, they, they set aside that legitimate activity, and they devoted themselves to prayer. What's eating our time today? What, what is it that we spend our time on? Probably not cooking. I'll tell you what we spend our time on. On those little things that you hold in your hand called an iPhone. And social media, and surfing the internet, and watching Fox News, or whatever you watch, CBN, or whatever you watch up here, CNN, I hope you don't watch that. Anyway, whatever you watch, it eats up hours. If you were to do a timesheet of every minute of every day, just for a week, don't change your activities, just do what you do, and do a timesheet, and then look at it at the end of the week, I think some of us would be in a state of shock. How much time we waste on things that have no profit. And so maybe we need a media fast to seek the face of God. You can't have one until the website's finished. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? This is, this, this is consuming. But, we, but there's no point doing it just for the sake of doing it. You have to have a burdened heart. So burdened that Lord, I, I, I just have to set everything aside and seek your face. And so that's what they did. That's what this man did. And, and by the way, one just a, a quick thing. It says, um, I fasted, prayed before the God of heaven. And he did it for certain days. We're going to see. We're going to see as we go forward. This was not a quick fix thing. He, he did it for quite some time. He was so burdened that he prayed. Uh, for certain days, it says, I wept and mourned certain days. Certain days, we can be quite specific, it was actually five months. Because verse 1 tells us it was the month Chislu. Uh, when he began this prayer, he says, uh, in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, I was in Shushan, the palace. And then, if we look at chapter 2, verse 1, it says, it came to pass in the month Nisan, and in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. I took up wine and gave it to the king, and, he, and I had not been before time sat in his presence. And so, between those two dates is approximately five months. Five months of seeking God in prayer before he did anything. Isn't that amazing? He wasn't impetuous. He didn't just fly off the handle. He prayed about this earnestly for five solid months. Wow. No wonder God used this man. I mean, you talk about prayer fuel as he goes into this. He's got five months of prayer fuel before he actually even goes to Jerusalem. It's amazing to think. And so, 
We could say this. The cause of his response was a realization of the conditions as they really were. And I honestly believe that we'll never become like Nehemiah until we realize the conditions as they really are. In other words, we have to, before you can ever have a cure, you have to have a proper diagnosis. So until we diagnose the state we're in and realize it, we're, we're never going to get the burden to pray like this man did. But once it dawns on us how bleak things really are, then it will drive us to seek the face of God like he did. And this is exactly what he does. He couldn't build the wall before he had to first weep over the ruins. The rubble had to be first watered with tears before a new wall could arise out of the ashes. And so often, we want to see God do something. We need to begin in the place of prayer. Seeking his face, seeking his blessing, being honest about the reality of the way it is. And I wonder, have we mourned over the indifference in many of our assemblies? Have we mourned over the open displays of the flesh which have gone on in many of our assemblies? Have we mourned concerning the long-term history of moral failure amongst the people of God? There's a lot of things that we could be mourning about. The lack of zeal for the gospel. We could go on and on. Lots of things we should be in mourning about. And so, we find that this man, we've seen his anxiety for God's people, we've seen his anguish of soul. But now we're going to look, after our break, at his admission of sin.